Come on, buddy. They almost got you back there. Is that a seven and a half inch AR with a muzzle brake on it? Come on, buddy. Let's get you set up. Well, as time marches on, things seem to be getting crazier and crazier. As this happens, it necessitates a little bit of exchange of knowledge, guys. For no particular reason, I'm talking about CONUS for no particular reason. The point is, is that these are skills that are going to be important. So we're gonna be continuing our talk on recce work. Specifically here, we will be talking about recce rifle setup. Now, a lot of the principles that you guys know and love certainly apply to the recce rifles and to our rifles that will be completing that type of role. But there are a couple of things that are more specialized to these rifles that you might want to know about and a little bit more on some team dynamics. So guys, once again, for part two, I hope you guys will be inclined to join us for how to become deadly in the mountains. So if you've ever been out in the woods and you've forgotten your TP, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, like and comment. The comment section is out of control. I will do nothing to control it, but for this particular video, I do want you guys to try to keep the comments focused on things that are pertaining to the subject at hand. There are going to be recce guys out there. There are going to be recon marines. There's going to be scout guys out there from cab units, and you guys will have a lot of experience and knowledge that I would love to have because as much as I'd like to take, you know, a full day, a full week, a full month to teach you this particular topic, we just don't have that time. So make the comment section somewhere worth going to. Guys, the biggest support of the channel right now is, of course, Brownells. A big thank you to them. Pretty cool that they're supporting it. And this particular video is sponsored by Manscaped. We'll talk more about that later. Pretty, I wonder if they know they're sponsoring this video. In any case, they're sponsoring the video. So a big thank you to them. So, my ladies, my gentlemen, and my often forgotten, but most certainly not by me, SR25s, welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about probably one of my favorite topics, and that is going to be rifles made for fighting in the mountains. So there are a lot of considerations to be had when it comes to mountain fighting, to recon work, and all that type of stuff. And as far as my background, I've been in the military for a long time now. Uh, served as a SEER specialist for a long time, so I've spent a lot of time in the woods, a lot of time evading, a lot of time uh, going to different tracking courses, both tracking and counter tracking. And then after that, did a job was a little more applicable to what we we're talking about today. So um, I have a lot of experience, and then in addition to that, all of our information is cross-checked with multiple different individuals, and we'll be having a lot of really cool people onto the channel very soon to talk about some more specialized skill sets. But as always, get in there, spread some knowledge, and let's make this place good. So when it comes down to a rifle for recce, for reconnoitering type work, what we have to remember is we need to stay lightweight, we need to be able to work in engagement distances, and of course we need to keep this weapon camouflage. And we'll be talking about that as it pertains to SILs, which as you know is stop, look, listen, smell. But before we get into that, let's start off by talking about caliber. So when it comes down to it, 5.56, 545 by 39, 762 by 39, these calibers all perform very well. And the reason that we choose them is that although they're a little bit more anemic compared to our actual battle rifle cartridges, like a full power rifle round, what they do allow us to do is carry a lot of ammunition. So what you have to consider is your environment. The mountains of the Pacific Northwest, where we're residing right now, are very different from the mountains of Colorado, from the mountains on the East Coast, or from wherever you may live. So you have to understand that you're going to have to choose a caliber that is going to work for the engagement distances that you see. If you're in very thick brush most of the time, a 5.56 is going to be fine because you're probably not going to be that far much out past five to 600. Now, if all of your engagement distances are 800 plus, you might consider going up to a larger caliber. But there is one thing that we can say when it comes down to the type of caliber that you do select. Typically, 
Engagements have shown throughout the years between organized forces that the force with more ammunition typically wins. And that is because there's more than just a shot impacting somebody that decides a conflict. There is, of course, suppression, there's maneuver, there's a lot that occurs. So it is for this reason that lighter calibers like 5.56 and 5.45 and 7.62x39 perform very well as you can carry a lot of ammunition. With that being said, despite how effective 5.56 is out to 5, 600 meters, even a little bit beyond, it should be noted that if you're in a team type environment, it might be really good to have an individual who can have some type of designated marksman's rifle or something along those lines. Now, right here, we do have an LMT rifle in 6.5 that is a 1200 meter rifle all day. As cool as this thing is, I know a lot of people aren't going to have these. So when it comes to a longer range platform, you have to understand something as simple as your classic deer rifle can do really, really well in that type of role. And that's also something that you can typically carry on you in addition to your main fighting rifle. So again, a little bit of roll differentiation is gonna be good. And these larger calibers like 308, 65, 300 Win Mag that can really extend, extend your range can be extremely beneficial. So if you do have more than just yourself, and you should have more than just yourself with you in these types of roles, it can be very good to have somebody who has a larger caliber for extending those engagement distances as you need. Of course, they'll be carrying a little bit less, but as a quick note, it's a good thing to have. Now, also, if you can have a belt fed, even better. Belt fed's a little bit hard to get, they shouldn't be, but if you can get your hands on a belt fed, awesome as well. With that out of the way, let's do our little sills here. So just like we talked about in the first recce video, stop, look, listen, smell. And let's apply this specifically to our rifles. So any trained force is going to perform sills in some way or another. So we're gonna apply that directly to how we get these rifles ready for a recon for a recce type environment. So first thing we wanna do is they're gonna stop, they're gonna look. So what you wanna do is just look at your weapon. Does it blend? Just like a Ninja Blender, this thing should blend in as many places as is possible. Now, even here in very green Washington where we're at right now, there is a lot of browns and you're typically closer to the ground. So brown is always a very good color to go with. Now, when it comes to camouflaging your rifle, if you wanna come in here and take a look at it, there are multiple, multiple different ways to camouflage your rifle, both in terms of pattern and in terms of color palette. Now, if you're in a desert type environment, splotches tend to work really well. If you're in a tropical environment, what a lot of people do is they'll take vegetation and use that to spray paint around. That was something that Travis Haley taught me from his time and his knowledge of the tropics. Now, in the case of where we're at right now, stripes to break up the silhouette of the weapon work really well. You have to understand that as far back as World War I, they knew that these weapons stuck out and they began to camouflage them. The Rhodesians got really good at it and ever since then, people have been working on perfecting it. Now, the point is, paint your rifle and beyond that, don't care so much when you paint your rifle. Just get at it. The less you care about the rifle, the better it's gonna be when you're painting the sky. Of course, tape off things that shouldn't be painted like lenses and like the internals of the weapon, but otherwise go crazy. And the biggest thing is, is a lot of people get really intricate with the design. You don't really need a micro pattern. This is meant to break up the silhouette from far away. So have big sweeping patterns and that's going to work very well. So we have this guy right here. Those are Knight's Armament SR-15. As you can see, very simple camouflage pattern. We have our Stag Arms, just basic M16A4 clone right here. This one was more recently painted. And then of course we have our URGI, which in addition to the paint also has a couple other elements on here. So if you wanna come in here and take a look, uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll use some type of camo tape or something like that in order to camouflage different parts of their weapon. What's nice about it is it adds a little bit of texture and especially as it begins to get more dirty, it begins to look very natural. Now we're not going full on sniper rifle on this or anything like that because you wanna keep this weapon pretty maneuverable, but these are all simple things that you can do to your weapon to keep it pretty camouflaged. So there's a couple quick notes for you guys. Well, quick aside guys, uh, we wanna thank Manscaped for of course sponsoring this video and making it possible to make a lot of cool content. Now, here's the thing about it. We're not in the woods yet. So if you want to groom yourself, if you don't, it doesn't matter. But if you do, uh, 
Manscaped's pretty good. You know, funny enough, um, I actually used Manscaped before they even hit me up about doing ads, so it was a pretty easy consideration as far as doing ads to them. Now, when it comes to Manscaped, there's a couple of reasons I do like them. So let's get into it. So one thing that I like is a lawnmower 4.0. So wireless charging, little light to show you where you're shaving. It works really well. It's pretty much ball safe. Obviously don't go shoving this into the folds, but it works pretty damn good. And this thing does fuck. Now, they of course have a couple other things. They have a nose hair trimmer and that thing's also good. And you can also trim your ears with it and all that kind of stuff. The point is, if you can keep yourself looking smart and looking sharp, it's kind of a good thing to do. So the all-in-one grooming kit for Manscaped is a pretty damn good option. Now, if you have a buddy, you don't know what gift to get him. I think Manscaped's actually kind of a hilarious thing to get them as well as a pretty cool thing to get them. So, or, you know, whoever you might have in your life that you need to get something for, Manscaped is a really good option. Now, what I want you guys to do, go down into the description, manscaped.com, use discount code THUMB20, get yourself two free gifts and get in there. And a big thank you to them for sponsoring this video good times. So let's get back into becoming deadly in the mountains. Now, when it comes to camoing your rifle, here's what's going to be important. Your suppressor right here, don't paint it. A couple reasons. One, the paint is going to cook off from the heat. Suppressors get very hot. When they get really hot, they're going to cook off that paint. That paint's going to get in the smoke. That could possibly give away your position. So there are a couple different options there. We have different types of camo wraps. Like you can see right here from burn proof gear that we have on this suppressor right here. And of course, there are suppressors that are already kind of an FDE color, like we have right here with our Surefire can. But make sure that you don't paint directly onto it. It's typically, typically not going to work for you very well. In addition to that, while we're talking about our look portion of camouflaging the weapon, it's going to be important that we try to keep the flash signature down on the different parts of the weapon that are reflective. Now, this also applies to personal camouflage as well, which we'll talk about in a further video. But think of things that can reflect. Most importantly is going to be the lens off of our light right here. So one solution to this right here, as you can see, I just took an Aimpoint bikini cover. I cut it. I put it over the lens of the flashlight and I taped it on. That's an easy way to keep that from shining. So the reason for camouflaging those is my buddy was recently on an exercise and they had they were just getting lit up by a recon element and they couldn't find out where these guys were shooting from. So my buddy had a mod light with one of the far throw heads. He shined it about 600 meters away against the hillside and it reflected off of the light lenses on their weapons and they're able to get their, those guys' position zeroed and do call for fires. Now, of course, my buddy's position was already compromised so it didn't really matter as much. The point is, is if at all possible, we wanna keep those reflections down. Also think about the sun or anything that could occur that could cause a reflection. So we have our lens cap there. Now on the Trigicon RMR we have on top right here, we have a kill flash. Now this is from Tenebrex, they don't stay on very well. So I went ahead and I taped that bitch on. And as you can see here, that's gonna kill the reflection from the RMR. Now from the back, not as much as you can do, but you do what you can. Now on the optic itself, there are of course kill flashes that you can put on, but more important than that, is going to be keeping the weather off of the lenses of your optics because weather really fuck you up. So there are different types of coatings that you can put on and treatments that will help the water to beat off. The problem is, is that those can freeze. So depending on the environment, that may or may not be a good option for you. In general, I tend to use scope caps. These are Tenebrex and these work really well for keeping the lens caps dry. So these work really well for keeping the optic dry and then of course for killing flash. So that's what we have when it comes to our optics and for keeping these weapons camouflaged. Now another thing to notice as well is of course most of these weapons have some type of suppressor on there. Suppressors are awesome. They do a really good job of eliminating flash completely as well as making the sound signature hard to detect precisely where you're firing from. So a suppressor is a very good thing to have in these types of roles. Now, if you can't afford a suppressor, you can't get one for whatever reason, um, typically your A2s do pretty well. And even better than that would be like a three prong. So from Surefire or Knight's Armament, those three prongs do really, really well at eliminating flash. And we do want to eliminate flash. Don't use a muzzle brake. That's going to more easily give away your position. So we've talked a lot about the looks, about the camouflage of the weapon. Nothing that a lot of people don't think about is going to be the sound that your weapon makes. 
So we'll try to illustrate that with this weapon right here. A lot of the QD mounts that you have on your weapons can make a lot of noise. So right here, pretty quiet overall. Of course, we have a little bit of rattle in the magazine right here. But the point is, is you can easily make your weapon much more quiet by getting rid of QD. So something as simple as a, simple as a paracord sling attachment works really well. And on the buttstock, almost all buttstocks nowadays allow you to thread the sling directly through the buttstock. That makes for a very quiet setup and a little bit more so than your typical QD mounts. Um, Blue Force gear also makes a really good uh, universal sling mount that you can use on AKs and different types of weapons. So those are all good things to do. Again, this is going to play into complete camouflage, right? So myself, I should be quiet when I'm moving. My pack shouldn't be rattling so much. It should be packed in such a way that I don't make a lot of noise. And that also plays into your weapon. So this is all playing into a complete package here. But right now we're just focusing on the rifle side of things. So we've stopped, we've looked, we've listened, smell. So strong smelling solvents can possibly give you away. Try to use a neutral smelling solvent. And of course, when it comes to painting your weapon, make sure that you're using your weapon and allowing the dirt to permeate into the paint. That way you don't get that paint smell. As that dirt permeates into the paint, it gives it a better color and it begins to blend in better with the environment as a quick note. And of course that brings us back to our suppressor. Don't paint your suppressor because if you shoot with that paint on the suppressor, it's gonna smell, they're gonna smell that paint cooking off from a long way away, especially for people who are used to be in the woods and aren't used to those synthetic smells because they've been out there for a while that's gonna possibly give you away. Now, we've gone over our sills at this point. Now, we wanna talk a little bit to the rifle itself. Now, every variant shown here is pretty much an AR of some type, and that's not to say that ARs are the only weapon you should choose. When it comes to your Reiki rifle, there are tons of good rifles out there from the M110s to the SCARs to XCRs to whatever, tons of great rifles. The point is the thing that matters most is that you have spare parts for your weapon and that you know how to service it. So as with everything, make sure that you know this weapon really well. And then of course that you have the spare parts and the know-how on how to replace those parts. Now, for the most part, we're using ARs because it's a simple, reliable and effective system, but in really cold environments, it might not be the best thing to use. So again, for your environment, pick what's going to work best for you. Now, a little bit on setup right here. So if you come in, <laughs> what's, gonna be important, what's gonna be important is of course, having uh, different ways of sighting your weapon. I typically have iron sights on my weapon because as archaic as they are, people are gonna get mad at me at that. I did qualify in iron sights. Um, what's good about them is in really bad weather, the lens doesn't fog up on them. So there is certainly a point to having iron sights on your weapon. I typically do recommend some type of low power or medium power variable optic. So the low power is being like a one to eight or a one to 10. In this case, we have a one to eight from Night Force. But the Leupold series like the Mark V has some really good medium power variable optics that a lot of people have been using and those perform really well. We're not gonna get into so much, you know, which optic you should have other than to say that a little bit of magnification is going to go a long way in terms of being able to see who you're trying to fire at or even identify who you're looking at. So that positive ID is going to be important. Up here we have the RMR and that's for passive night vision shooting. That works really well, NBD there. Now, over here we have of course our weapon lights, lots of different good weapon lights, Surefire, um, Mod Light, Arisaka, um, Cloud Defensive. Find one that you like that works well for you. And a lot of my weapon lights that I have right here, I have a dual weapon light where it uses both IR as well as white light with the simple twist of the head on the weapon light. And those are pretty cool because that allows for um, kind of drop in a little bit of weight on an IR system if I don't need any type of laser, such as we have here with this Engal. Maybe you don't need a laser system because everyone else has night vision, it's gonna fuck you up. Finally, what's gonna be important as well is going to be your ammunition. And that comes into barrel length as well. If you notice, all of these weapons are longer, all the way up to a 20 inch fucking musket right there, my Marines know. And the reason for that is that especially on these intermediate calibers, or even, even larger calibers, longer barrels just do better. They are both more effective with the ammunition. They both have less drop. They just work better. 
So a lot of people have been using very short weapons, which work really good in urban environments. And we'll talk more about urban considerations in a further video series. But with those really short rifles, the problem is that they typically rely upon ammunition that's a little bit harder to source. So if your Mark 18 only reliably fragments to 80 yards and you have to make use of a different type of specialty ammunition, that's awesome. However, how much of that ammunition do you have? And the whole point I'm bringing up is that with a longer barrel, you take training ammunition and you make it into duty ammunition. A 20 inch M16 like we have right here does a really good job at making 55 grain an absolute vibe checker. So yes, it's old. Yes, it's not the newest, most Gucci design, but you know what? A 20 inch, 50, uh, a 20 inch rifle launching a 55 grain projectile is going to fuck your world up compared to a 55 grain projectile out of 10.3. I, I don't want to get shot by either of them, but if we're talking which one's more effective, 100%, a longer barrel is better. So on a lot of these guns, we have 16 to 14.5, and those are awesome. The whole point is when it comes to ammunition, make sure you have a lot of it. We're talking on your person, at least eight to 10 mags, and in your pack, maybe another eight to 10 as well. If we look to some of the earlier giants, the people who pioneered a lot of this stuff, I had the unique opportunity of talking to a lot of long range recon patrol guys from the Vietnam War. And their whole deal was they carried a living shit ton of ammunition because like I said at the beginning, whoever has the most ammunition typically wins. And now all this stuff might seem a little bit excessive, but I want you to really think about this. Take your rifle out right now, go walk, I don't know, through a park, walk, don't scare anybody. Walk somewhere in nature. How much noise do you make? How well does your weapon blend in? Is it really the best you can do? And really think to yourself, if I was being hunted, if I was hunting somebody, is this how I want my rifle to sound? Is this how I want my, want my rifle to look, to perform? Be honest with yourself and take this stuff seriously because it absolutely matters. But what matters even more then any of that is going to, of course, be training. Make sure that you get training. These rifles are awesome. The setups that we have are effective. However, if you don't have the training, it's not going to matter. The guy with the Stag Arms M16 is absolutely going to fuck your world up if you have the Gucciest Knight's Armament gun, if you never train with it, if you never practice recce, if you never do any of this stuff. Get out there, practice, make yourself the weapon, that is what is going to matter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. A little bit more serious tone in this video, but I want you guys to get into those comment sections, ask questions, provide commentary. Let's make this place good. I'm sorry we couldn't talk about this for a longer period of time. Plenty more videos coming on Becoming Deadly in the Mountains. Stay tuned. I've got nothing else for you. Final thing for you guys, fitness. If you're not fit, you're gonna die. Get out there, run, work out. Don't die, guys. Take care.